Georgian Bagian, the first and only astronaut of Armenian descent. He has participated in two space flights, STS-29 and STS-40. And now he is in Armenia for Starmus Festival. Uh, and thanks to the co-founder of the Starmus Festival, Garik Israelian, we have this amazing opportunity to talk to a man who has been in space twice. And also I would like to thank Infocom team for providing us the technical support and studio to bring this interview into reality. Mr. Bagyan, uh, thanks for taking the time to join us. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's your first time in Armenia. How does it feel here? Oh, it feels great. We've been here for two weeks now and the experience getting to see Armenia in general and Yerevan has been great. The people especially have been very warm and welcoming and makes, make me feel, and my wife is here with me, at home. And I feel like I'm in a, in a city anywhere. It's, you know, I can't tell the difference between Yerevan and Philadelphia in, in the United States. I feel very at home. So you have become a hero for the whole nation, like the, our only representative uh, in space. Did you know about that before Starmus, and what did you feel about it? Well, when I flew on STS-29 back a long time ago, in 1989, I guess that's what, 33 years ago? It doesn't seem that long ago. I remember when I landed, somebody said to me at that point, you're the first Armenian uh, astronaut. And, and, you know, this is the Arme I heard from the Armenian community in the United States. And they were very proud of it, and I was, I felt fortunate to be able to do that. Uh, I felt embarrassed, in a way, because I'm just doing my job. My job is to go be an astronaut. Uh, I was fortunate to get, be able to do that, but I was glad to now the Armenians could say Armenians have flown in space too. So I was, I was glad for that opportunity. You have participated in the Starmus Festival, which brings the greatest minds, uh, scientists and artists in one place. Uh, what are your impressions about the festival? Did it, uh, did it uh, meet uh, your expectations? Well, you know, certainly I had never been to Starmus before. I understood what it was supposed to be about, but reading about it isn't the same as participating and being there. I thought it was, not only was the, is the idea really a good idea, but the way it puts together to take music and the arts along with science, and the fact is there is in a relationship, they're not separate totally. Uh, so I was really uh, happy that I was invited. Uh, Garrick Israeli invited me. And I had friends that had been before, and they said, oh, you should definitely go. It's a tremendous opportunity, and I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it from a number of, for a number of reasons. One, to meet the other people that were there. You know, I met people that I hadn't met before, both on the, uh, the music side as well as the scientific side. And there were different topics that I didn't know much about, and we shared some thoughts about things where our interests actually interlocked. So I, I look forward to following those. But I think more than that, especially being in Armenia, it was a chance to, my first visit to Armenia, and, and see the people and, and learn more about the people here, which was probably, I have to say, the high point of my stay here. Uh, coming to your space experience, I know that space is hard, and to become an astronaut, you really need something very, like a strong goal or an inspiration, because there are harsh there is harsh environment, and uh, you need to have this strong goal so that the difficulties cannot uh, like uh, uh, make you give up uh, in the middle of the way. So, what was your inspiration? How did you decide to become an astronaut? Will you share with us your little story of becoming an astronaut? Note. Sure. Well, uh, as you say, you know, my, uh, my grandparents came from West Armenia to the United States around 1905, mm -hmm. right around there. And then, uh, so my father and his brothers and sisters were born in the United States. And um, we were always brought up to think that the most important thing is to learn as much as you can, to always do your best, and to never give up if you set a goal. Those, I think, are good things to do, whether you're a child being raised and first going to school, or whether you want to be an astronaut. Because regardless of what you want to do, if you know things, one of the things I think, and maybe because of being Armenian, was the things that are in your head, no one can take away. They can take your land away. They, can take, they can't take what's in your head. So the point is, that's with you. And then the, the part of the, the, uh, your spirit, 
that say, I will always do my best. The only one that knows if you did your best is you. No one else can tell. You know yourself if you did your best. You might have done better than other people, but it may not have been your best. And as a young child, I can very distinctly remember my father saying to me, if you don't get a, very, a good grade in school, I'll help you do better. But the only thing I insist on is you have to look me in the eye and tell me you did your best. I was five years old, five or six years old when he said that. And he was very serious. I mean, my parents, were it not for my parents, I would have done nothing. You know, absolutely important, but it was that. So when I was eight years old, uh, that was, you know, it was in 1961, mm -hmm. and Yuri Gagarin flew, Alan Shepard flew in the United States, like several weeks later, uh, and I was very interested in aviation. Uh, space flight was just beginning to be a thing. My father had been a fighter pilot in World War II, so he would talk about his flying and he enjoyed it. Um, and I always thought I'd be a pilot, and I thought, oh, be an astronaut. And I was eight years old. Uh, by the time I was 12, I matured, and I, I realized that no one gets to be an astronaut. No one gets to be president of the United States, so that is a foolish goal. Now, this is an important part. So at that point, I never thought about being an astronaut again. I wanted to be a pilot because I thought that was attainable. And to do that, I liked physics and math and science, so I thought I'll be an engineer. Um, and I was an athlete in school and did things like that. But, but those things are the, are the foundational elements. So doing your best, never quitting, you know, all this, getting, learning all you can. I was going to go be a pilot, you know, be an engineer, be a pilot, and then I ended up becoming a medical doctor. And it wasn't until I was 24 and I was uh, just finishing medical school and there was an ad in a magazine and it said, NASA is accepting applications to be a space shuttle astronaut. And I go, hmm, what's that mean? So I wrote away in the mail, it came back and it was very thick uh, and I started filling it out. And uh, there were many things I thought I did well, but then it asked questions like, how many hours have you flown? Pilots talk about that. But then it said, don't include aircraft that have less than 550 horsepower. Well, light airplanes don't have that much. That means most of my time didn't count. The next block to fill in was how many combat missions had I flown? I hadn't flown any combat missions. So I thought, how can I apply when I can't even enter numbers for some of the things that they wanted to know. So I put the application aside, and then it came to the deadline to turn it in. And I figured, well, I'll fill it out. I filled it out, mailed it away. It was in February. And then in April, they were supposed to tell you if you got accepted or didn't. April came and went, I heard nothing. And I figured that my application was so poor, so bad, that they didn't want to waste the stamp to mail the rejection back. So I, can t I wasn't surprised because I thought when I couldn't even fill certain things out, obviously I wouldn't be qualified. So I finished medical school. I started as a surgeon, a, a trainee, a resident. Like uh, in Britain, they call them registrars, junior doctor. And then I get a call one evening from NASA, and it says, are you still interested in being an astronaut? And I go, well, what do you mean? And they says, well, if you're interested, we'd like you to come down here for an interview. And I said, well, in April, this was in July. I said, in April, I thought you were going to let everyone know. And they said, well, we're always late. They go, uh, but we're just getting around to it. So I said, sure. So I went down, interviewed. It's about a week where they give you physical tests, mental tests, psychological tests, uh, all, all physical fitness tests, how strong you are, things like that. And I went through, and then lo and behold, after that, I was selected. Never thought that would happen. But I, I guess the point here is that even though when I went from being 8 to 12 years old, that I said nobody gets to do that, the things I was doing that I enjoyed still prepared me to be an astronaut. And because I continue to try hard, do my best, and do that, when I, I wouldn't have done anything differently. I mean, if I was going to be an astronaut, all the things I did were fine. And it was just the opportunity came there, and then I, I was lucky. And I would say any astronaut that I know would tell you that they were lucky because there are many thousands of people that apply, and 
there, there's very many very skilled, very competent people, but it's like anything else. They can't pick everybody. So some of it is just for a reason that's hard to identify. You got selected. So I feel very fortunate. But that's how that came about. And it was just because of my father and my mother, what they told me, you know, how to go through. I, my interest in aviation came from seeing my, the joy that my father would express when he talked about his flying experience, that he really enjoyed it. So as many people do, if, they, if they, their parents tell them about things, they might say, wow, that sound must be really enjoyable. I'll do it too. But you have to do other things. You don't just show up and say, I'm going to be a pilot. You don't just get there and say, I think I'm going to be an astronaut. There are many things you have to do. The things that I enjoyed happened to be the things that made me a good candidate, a good person to be selected. But I feel very lucky. So they, they are just selecting 20 or 30 uh, people from the thousands of uh, applicants. And be, being a pilot is, was a must at that time? No, no, it was not. It was, there were two kinds, at that time, there were two types of astronauts, or three actually. But in this selection, for the, what they call professional astronauts, there were full-time astronauts. There were astronaut pilots and astronaut mission specialists. Now, some of the mission specialists were also pilots. But they were being hired not to fly, this is the space shuttle, not to fly the space shuttle, but to launch satellites, do science experiments, do spacewalks. So the shuttle, its job was to take things to space so that work could be done and then come back and be reused. So the pilot's job was to get it there and get it back. Yeah. The mission specialist's job is to do while you're there. The, the analogy would be if you think oceanographic ships, the ship is to do oceanography, is to study you know, marine animals, look at the bottom of the ocean, look at the chemicals in the ocean, and that's an oceanographer, a scientist. The captain is in charge of the ship to keep it afloat, to get it where it needs to be and get it home safely. But the person that it's there to support is the oceanographer. In the space shuttle, it was the same way. The pilots are very important. They're to get it there safely and back. But the reason they're going is there's mission specialists to do the job that's there to do. If there were no mission specialists, there'd be no reason. Yeah. You know, so they work together. It's a team. It's an important team. It requires both. It's hard to be selected as an astronaut, but it's even harder to train for uh, flying to space. Uh, how many years does it take to train? And uh, in general, what, what kind of trainings do you undergo before going to space? Okay. Well, it, it takes, it's hard to say. When you start out, you spend the first two or three years learning things in general, the, how the systems work, what they are. But then after about the first year of that, you also get uh, jobs where you're assigned to work a project. You know, it could be a payload, a satellite that's going to fly. So they call them technical assignments. So you're working with the engineers and others to support other missions that are going to fly. So it does two things. One, you're highly trained anyway, and they figure you're going to be motivated, so that's good. But in doing that, you get experience, not just about payloads that you will fly, but how it all works. So after you spend, it depends, three, four years, at that point, then they say, okay, now we'll assign you to a specific payload or thing, and then you spend your time not worrying about anything else. You just worry about what you're going to do on that mission. Now, I was there before we flew the first shuttle mission. So I was there from the beginning. So we're learning as we went. And I was there for the, what, what first 14 years? Uh, how long? 12 years. We've been flying shuttles. So I went from the beginning to that point. So we still were learning. Like, I was in charge of the first uh, life sciences space lab, which was a big um, medical physiologic lab, to, like you would find in a medical school. So I was first assigned to that in 1984. And we thought we were going to fly in 85, or maybe it was even earlier than that, 83. We're going to fly in 85. And then things got delayed because we had to make the, the machines work. Like, for example, in the whole space lab, the power it took to run the whole space lab is as much as one hair dryer. Like a hair dryer? The power for that powered this entire physiology lab. That's very hard to design all those equipment to be able to operate on that small amount of power. So not only did we have to do the experiments, we had to build equipment that could operate with almost be very efficient. That was a huge task aside from doing the experiments. And I was involved with that. And then I was involved with the, the uh, university investigators to how to find out what they wanted to find out and to be trained by them 
because me and, and my other colleagues that were flying were going to be their eyes, ears, and hands to do the mission. So if, as we're doing it, things didn't look just right, we had to have enough understanding to know what to do. We couldn't get on the radio and say, what do we do now? Sometimes you can, but usually you can't. So it's things you would discover that nobody thought about. So that takes another for Space Lab several years. So it would have taken, for me, it, would have been, it should have been two or three years to just train for Space Lab, but then we had the Challenger accident and that delayed us another two years. But normally it takes, it used to take two years in the beginning. Once you would finish the first three or four, then two years. And then once we did it again and again and again, if it was a mission that we already had done many times, well then you're not learning. It's, it's we know exactly how to do it. So the next group that comes in, instead of two years, it would be a year. Mm -hmm. And then we train them in a year. So most people would wait at least five years for their first flight or even out to you know, seven or eight or even nine. In my case, it was really almost nine because we had the Challenger accident, which was three years delay. So just as I, I, was, I was supposed to fly on Challenger, our mission was, and then a lot of reasons happened. They wanted to fly a teacher, so they put that crew there so they could fly a teacher because it was good press for the public relations. And unfortunately, you know, they were killed. That would have been us that were being killed otherwise, but then everything delayed three years. So then I've worked on how do we understand what happened? How do we develop an escape system so they would survive? Would it to happen again? That we thought there would be a very good likelihood that Challenger happened again, that crew would survive. So I was had a large part in doing that. So that was a different job, but a very important job and a very satisfying job. Uh, I always wondered if astronauts regret when the uh, like when the spacecraft takes off, and uh, do they regret at that time? What did you feel? Uh, when you say regret, how do you mean like? Uh, why have I chosen to become? Oh, a okay. Yeah, like like I should I, I made a bad decision. You mean like I shouldn't go? I, yeah. Oh, well, that's a great question. Uh, I think everyone's different. I don't think anybody thinks that. I think there were some people after the first accident, and everyone was killed, that while we knew it was very dangerous and the chance of us losing a shuttle, we thought we'd lose whenever, you know, 25 or 40 missions. That's not many. Uh, I mean, not, you know, imagine if anybody flying a flight, you thought one out of 30 flights crashed. That would make you think if you want to go fly on a flight, right? Um, I think everybody understood that pretty much, but you can intellectually know it. But then when it happens, and now here's the people that were in the office next to you, or that you live next to are dead, it's now real. It's, it's no longer like, well, yeah, it's like, could you be killed driving in a car here in Yerevan? Yes. Do you worry about it? Sometimes. Sometimes maybe, but usually no. Usually. But if, if one of your best friends was just killed, you know, in a car in Yerevan or crossing the street, it might cause you to think a little bit again. I mean, because it's the human mind, it's not just, you know, make an equation and do it. It's, it's how emotionally it affects you. So some people it affected more than others, you know, to fly. I mean, they still wanted to fly, but I think it made them maybe more realistic that there's real, there's a real risk. But once again, if this is your goal, anything worth doing takes some cost. You know, the effort you put into it, the professional risk, all kinds of things. Uh, so the people have to understand, am I willing to take that chance? So, I mean, was I, did, it, did it concern me? Would I be killed? Yes. I mean, I think anybody that doesn't go through their mind, they could be killed, must be insane. But, but there's many things you could be killed doing. You know, I mean, I also skydive. I also ride motorcycles. I don't want to be killed. Uh, but I think we take, we take, we reduce the risk to a level that the pleasure, the satisfaction of doing it is worth that chance. Everybody's different. You know, some people say, I don't want to ride motorcycles. That's okay. Some people do. Some people say, I'm afraid to fly in an airliner. That's okay. They don't have to, but, so I think everybody looks at it differently. I think, I think most people understand when they fly, when they say goodbye to their family, that this really might be goodbye, that they won't see them again. I think everybody understands that. Uh, they might all smile and wave to the camera, but it's in the back of their mind. Besides the launch part, what are the other difficult parts of the space flight? Well, I think as far as difficulty, uh, the challenge, I'll say challenges. Um, there's many things to do on a space flight. And the most precious resource we have is time. We have a certain amount of time we're there. We want to get as much things we can get done mm -hmm. 
as possible. So you're working very hard to make sure you get everything done and even do more if you can. So that means if you're going to do your best, is it ever good enough? Because you could you always do a little more. So you want to make sure you get everything done. You want to make sure you do it well, because if you don't do it well, sometimes there's scientists that have been waiting whole labs, you know, I mean, it could be hundreds of people are waiting to see what you found out. And if you don't find it, their work is worthless that they've been maybe preparing for, in one case, one, you know, one of my, on my space lab, they've been waiting 10 years, 10 years for this to fly. And in fact, on this particular mission, one of our, my colleagues ruined their equipment on the first day, didn't use it correctly and broke it. So here they'd waited 10 years and it was ruined on the first day of a 10 day mission. And they, you know, and the ground told us, okay, we're gonna redo your timeline, like your plan, your agenda, your schedule. And, they, and they, they thought it couldn't be fixed. And I remember that night I thought about it. And I was in charge of maintenance, if there was any, you know, fixing things. And I also was the lead mission specialist, later they called them payload commanders, for the, the space lab. And I knew what all the, the medical equipment we had. And as I was floating there, sleeping, I woke up in the morning an hour before we were supposed to wake up and I would look out the window as we would just come over the Strait of Gibraltar flying right down the Mediterranean. It was very beautiful. You know, you see there, here comes Italy and here comes the Middle East and, you know. And I thought, you know, I think we can take our, some of our medical injectable things. They have a needle, a very fine needle, 27 gauge. And it's the same size as the connector that my other crewmate had ruined. And I said, I bet I can cr cut those needles off and make it into an electrical connector. Now on the ground, the electrical maintenance people don't know what the medical kit is. So they said, we don't have anything like that. And I said, well, let me see. And I, and I got up and I took a wire cutters and I cut off the end of a bunch of needles and I reconstructed it and put it together. And then when we started the day, we weren't supposed to do this experiment. And I, and I, I it was called E for experiment 072. And I said, you know, I called the ground and I said, you know, Columbia ground, uh, uh, EO72 data take a look. And they go, no, no, it's canceled. It doesn't work. And I said, well, take a look at the data. And they go, there's data. So we save that, right? I mean, so the, in fact, the, uh, the professor who it was met me with a huge bottle of champagne when we landed because they thought they waited 10 years to get this and it was destroyed on the first day. So all these people whose career was spent getting this data was going to be worthless. So that's kind of the difficult thing. If you figured that out, and that was for me satisfying because everybody thought it was lost, but just by coincidence, because I had the science side and I had the maintenance side that I knew they could use equipment that was there for another reason, but I could still do that. So it helped us. So those are the difficult things, you know, when you have to improvise uh, and use your time wisely. So, you know, here we managed to use our time and help that, that investigator. So, that's the hardest thing, I think, really. You, know, you don't want to do a bad job. I think everybody uh, wants to do the best job they can and, and do the best for you know, the people that they're there to do a job for. There's an experiment or launch a satellite that the satellite's launched correctly. Yeah. And apart from these difficulties, space must be also enjoyable. Will you name some of the coolest advantages that you think people in space uh, feel over the ones on the ground? Well, I, th I think one of the things is you know being weightless, they'll call it, you know, you're floating. Uh, and it really, you get used to it pretty quickly, actually. I mean, you develop your skill, it takes more than a day. But in the first couple hours, I think, except for being sick, you know, about three quarters of the people get sick for a while. They get motion sickness or like seasickness or whatever. In fact, on the first mission, I came up with what was the cure. We cured it and then nobody worries anymore. They can take the, the you know, the medicine, the injection. But before that, it was an issue. But other than that, you, uh, once you're floating, it feels as if you were in a swimming pool and if the water was as warm as your skin. So if you ever put your hand into water that's just the temperature of your skin, it doesn't feel wet, it doesn't feel anything because it feels exactly like your hand. If it's warmer, it feels warm. If it's colder, it feels cold. If it's exactly the same, you're not even sure your hand's wet. Well now imagine being in a swimming pool and you just hang there, like drown proof they used to call it. So your, your hips will be bent a little bit, your knees will be bent, your arms float up like this, and when you sleep, you'll be like that. 
And that's what it's like. You don't have to move. You don't go anywhere. So you get used to it. But then you can start playing, like food. Food will float around. So you can't just, like you can't drink a, a glass of water. Not in a glass, because it'll just come out and be a big sphere. So you have a membrane with a straw in it, and you have to sip it out of the straw. If you're eating um, food, like what would be a good food? Uh, chicken teriyaki, like a, you know, or, or something, or a stew, a stew, like a, a meat stew, like, you know, like a, a goulash or something, right? It sticks together, or pilaf. Take pilaf, right? Pilaf has, it sticks together a little bit. So if you take pilav and you would put a fork in, you pick it up, it kind of sticks together and it kind of would stick to the fork and that would not be a problem. But if you had something like um, peas, there would be, these peas would be like floating all over. So you can't eat them that way. Uh, you can eat some things like um, canned fruit, like fruit cocktail, like in a syrup. If you're very careful, you can put a spoon in it and due to surface tension, it adheres to the spoon and if you're careful, you can get it all the way to your mouth without it floating away. In fact, you can even take the spoon, slowly accelerate it, and have it do flips, and then catch it in your mouth. So you'll play with the food. And, you know, M&Ms, candy M&M. So if you go to throw an M&M, like if somebody's across the vehicle, when we throw a, an M&M or a ball, you have to throw it up to get where it's going, right? Because gravity's pulling it down. So you don't throw in a straight line. You actually throw up and it comes down. Well, when you go to throw something when you're weightless, your whole life, you've always, you don't think about throwing up, you just know to, you have to throw a little more angle the farther the person is away. Well, you're in orbit, if I was gonna throw you an m and I'd probably hit you, you know, on top of your head because I think I have to make it go up. So instead you throw it like this. You push straight at somebody because you don't know how to do it that way, at least initially. So you learn to do things like that and we would play you know, let's say if I can, you know, you get maybe three meters away, can I throw an M&M that'll go right in your mouth? So we didn't have much time to play on my flights, but a few times we would do little things like that just to amuse ourselves. So I guess you don't use salt or pepper because... Oh, good point. Yeah, salt and pepper, they would just float around. So we use saline solutions, so we use a salt water. We use water with salt in it, so it's, it's a liquid, and we spray it on the food. Similarly, we take pepper and make it into a solution with water and spray it. The other thing we use a lot that people like is taco sauce. Mexican taco sauce you know, comes in little envelopes and, and that turns out to be almost like money. People get so many envelopes and people will trade it if people have already used all their taco sauce because if you were to stand on your head here on earth for a while, say for two hours, the blood tends to will go to your head, you're upside down and your sinuses, your nose will get stuffy like you had a cold. And just like when your nose is stuffy here, like you have a cold, you can't smell as well, you don't taste as well, so things taste differently. Well, when you're in space, it's always like that. So foods that you enjoyed here don't taste the same. You know, so for some people, if they expect it you know, to taste a certain way and it tastes different, they don't like it, it's surprising. So people put taco sauce on a lot because the, 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 the spicy taste still gets through. So people put taco sauce on almost everything so that it, it tastes differently. There's some things that taste terrible f to us, to me and, and my one crew. Uh, chocolates, a thing called malted milk balls where it's a center with milk chocolate. One of, the, one of the fellows flew them and it was in a plastic bag, Ziploc bag, he opens it and the smell, the aroma was so bad it made people nauseous and sick. And it was, what is that smell? And it was chocolate, but it smelled different. It, you know, it just because of the changes and everybody said it was making people physically ill so we said you have 10 minutes eat as many as you can eat and then we're throwing the rest away because it's making everybody sick so here he was looking forward to having for the whole mission eating this chocolate and made the smell made everybody sick in the in the shuttle so he had to throw it away so uh, you have to eat differently you know you season things differently but it's it's not a big deal I mean you get used to it very quickly and, and do it it's not a problem you have already mentioned that you are doing some experiments during your space, space flight. Can you name the most significant experiments that you conducted during your space flight? It's very difficult to say which one's the most significant. I guess I would say the most significant advance was on my first one where we, you know, I had came up with the, it's my favorite, 
I came up with the idea of how we might treat people for motion sickness so they weren't sick anymore because 75% of the people were sick. And many people didn't want us to do it and we did it and it worked. And now over 30 years later, that's what they still use and it made something that was a big problem for crew members. And now it's like, they don't even talk about it because it's no big deal. So to me, that was the most operationally significant. It changed the way we did business and it made it much better flight and we could do more work because if people are sick for the first two or three days, they're not doing a lot of work. In the scientific mission where we uh, had a space lab, it's hard to say. If I pick one, it'll make the other investigators jealous, you know, but I think one of the, was the way the cardiovascular system worked, the heart and how we regulated blood pressure. There have been experiments that were done here that we thought we understood what happened, but then, but you know, you can't be weightless for, you know, you can do it like if you fly an airplane in this parabolic flight, you get 20 or 30 seconds and then, you know, two Gs, you know, the other way, then 20 or 30 seconds. So it's, it's not really suitable to do that. It's not a good model. There's no rooms that you just turn a switch on the wall and the gravity goes away. That's on science fiction movies, it's not in real life. So the only way to go is to go into space. So we were trying things that people thought they knew. They thought they knew the way the blood would be distributed in the lung. And you know, John West was the professor that had had all these theories and I learned about in medical school and he was the one I worked with. So here was this giant of physiology and here I'm, you know, I read his books when I was in training and now I'm doing an experiment for his lab. That was an interesting experience for me. Uh, there were others, Leon Fiery, another one, uh, about the function of the lung and things like that. So when we did it, we found out things that they didn't think would happen. They thought when we went to weightlessness that there's a difference here on earth between where the blood is in the lung and where the oxygen is, where the, you know, the blood and the air aren't necessarily distributed the same, and you can think about it like bubbles in a, like if you have uh, sparkling water, the gas, the gas comes to the top. Well, in your lungs, the air tends to be more towards the top and the blood's more at the bottom. You'd like, to, the blood is what carries the oxygen to your body, so you'd like it to be distributed where the air is. Well, they thought in weightlessness, it would be like that. In theory, that's the way it was. When we did it, it wasn't true. And I remember I'm, I'm looking at, there was a strip chart recorder and I'm on this mouthpiece and you know, I call the ground, I'm getting ready to start and they see our data coming down. And I, I do it and I'm watching it because I know I've done this many, many, many times in training in the lab and I, I expect to see this new thing. It's only slightly different. And I said, have you seen, you see this data? And the, the person on the ground, our controller says, all the investigators are just shaking their head because they, they thought all their theories said it would be this way and it turns out we did not understand exactly how the body worked. Uh, we had others where we had collars that we wore around our neck and then it would either pull up pressure like sucking on our neck or pressing on our neck and that changes, you have sensors in your neck, the carotid sinus it's called, that regulate your heart rate to a certain extent. And, they, and we know we did it on the ground and we know how it worked. But once we got on orbit, the first day, it looked like you're on the ground. By the time day three or four, you could, you could do both, either suck on it or press on it, and the heart rate varied almost not at all, which tells us then when we come back, we depend on, that's one of the reasons that it helps us maintain our blood pressure so we get blood to our brain so we can function. It doesn't work as well. So it's a, it's a problem, we have to do other things. So that was something that people thought might be true, but they weren't really sure and we showed that was true. So it was those kinds of experiments where people had tried to get, guess by experiments on the ground and then we actually said, now we can do it. What is it like? Some work like we thought, others not at all, which is what science is about. It's, you know, we make hypotheses and then we test them. Some hypotheses we can test very well on the ground and others, they're analogs. They're sort of like it, but not exactly. And then when we have the opportunity to do the experiment we find out we didn't understand it as well as we could. And that's not disappointing. I mean, you want to know the truth, right? The point of science is to find out truth. And what is truth? Truth is by testing it, by experiments. So I think it was the cardiovascular, principally the cardiovascular things that were the most interesting, but even the vestibular, which is like your inner ear, your balance, we show that things that would make people very sick on the ground, like we put them in chairs, like an office chair that would spin around, we would go 60 times a minute. Once every second we would spin. 
And while we spun, we would put our head down, up, side up, side up, back up. Within a couple of minutes, everybody is violently sick. They're vomiting, almost. Almost everybody vomited, but very, very sick. After we were in orbit for 10 days and you brought people back, you could do that for an hour. They had no symptoms because their central nervous system adjusted after being in zero G. And for a while, this spinning made no difference. People thought that might be the case, weren't sure. Now, if you wait long enough, you wait two or three weeks, and then you try doing it, you get sick again. But when you first come back for about the first five to 10 days, we used to say you're bulletproof. These experiments can be divided like in two kinds uh, for helping uh, to improve uh, people's health conditions in space mm -hmm. and also experiments that are intended to improve uh, health technologies on Earth. Absolutely, yes, because as we understand, you know, some have immediate application there, but then there, there's, there's crossover. That is, we really understand the mechanism, we understand that some of our assumptions weren't true, so maybe, for instance, drugs you might want to develop, you say, oh, it's this other thing that really is the pivotal, it's the key to put in the lock, and really we should do it that way instead of this other way. So yes, it, it, and, and, and the reason for it, really, for most of the physiologic experiments, wasn't so much to fix problems that we were having in spaceflight. It was to understand how does the human body really work, and some things might help us in spaceflight, but really, I think most of the investigators felt that it was the things that we would learn that would help us understand how the human body works here that then would you know, point out uh, therapies, different things we could do to prevent disease or, or treat disease more effectively. So summing up uh, your experience, we can say that uh, people uh, having different professions in science, uh, like uh, go to space, and all of them uh, do experiments regarding to their field. So the space lab is all about that, I guess. Well, no, not exactly, actually. Uh, people have different backgrounds, but usually, while they want people, astronauts, cosmonauts, they want them to have experience in that field, usually you can't have enough people that you know, are specialist in neuro, you know, neurological function or in the carotid sinus or whatever. So you need to be trainable. So when they select astronauts, they want, they want to see, one, uh, do you, are you a hard worker? Two, do you do your best all the time, you know, as much as you can? Are you reliable? And these are my, this is not what NASA says, this is Jim Bade saying that. And are you educable? Can you be trained? Have you shown that you can learn new things? So they want to see already that you've learned things in many areas. So I was an engineer. I was also a physician. I was also a pilot. So I'd done different things. So I says, well, he can do these different things. So probably if we want him to learn something else, he probably can learn that too. Now, for the space lab, that's why I was chosen to do it, because I was an engineer and a physician. So they said, at least I already knew. I kind of spoke the language. I could communicate effectively with those people. But I learned things in much more depth that I never knew before. And, that, and it, was, it was essential, it was important that I was able to learn. There were other people that flew that had some medical background, but maybe not as much, but they were able to still learn, like we had people that were PhDs that knew one area of the basic science very well, but didn't know the clinical treatment of the medical things well, but they were able to learn what they needed to be every bit as useful because, I mean, you have several years to train, so if that's your job, you train them. So it's important that people have, have the willingness, bo both the ability, but also the desire to be trained in other things and learn new things. So I think an astronaut should be curious. If you're not curious, then you, you're probably not going to want to learn. You're not going to notice things that nobody noticed that don't look just right. And you're saying, well, why is that? And then you say, oh, this could be changed. Instead, you, you might think, they told me to do this, I'll do it. You don't want robots. Robots do some things well. They'll do what you tell them to do. But some things we haven't learned enough to make the robot able to do that. So you're relying on the, the person to see opportunities. I mean, just like the example I gave a bit ago about fixing the one piece of hardware. The way you could say it was programmed in the organization. The organization ran maintenance wasn't the same as the operation for the space lab. If there were robots, a maintenance robot, and a medical robot, they wouldn't be able to fix it. But they had somebody that knew both. We didn't plan it that way, but it worked out that way. Does that give a good idea of, I mean, you know, how the human can 
in the areas that are not as well understood, the crew member, by having a wide background and then in-depth knowledge in certain areas, can come up with novel solutions of what's going on that we couldn't plan for. Uh, many astronauts also talk about the overview effect. Uh, it's uh, when they see Earth from the above from 400 kilometers and they think of it like a tiny fragile ball uh, and they start to uh, take more care of it. Uh, do you have the same experience uh, and what do you feel seeing Earth uh, from space? I think, well, one is beautiful and, and what you can see is um, much better than even like when I flew, it was in the old days. So we were using 16 millimeter film. You've heard of film, right? <laughs> Not video. Now we have high definition video. But even high definition video doesn't have the resolution of a human eye. So the colors, much wider color palette. Um, so that's, you can't see it any other way. So that is one thing, it's just the beauty. When you look out at the horizon, and if you hold your fingers that far apart, you hold it at arm's length, that's how thick the atmosphere looks. It's this brilliant blue, like a neon blue. And you think, we all live in that little bit. You know, here's this huge earth, and we live there. Now, did it make me think that I take care of the earth better? No. I mean, I always knew that we're, you know, we live on this, it's like our own spaceship. It's the earth, but it's our spaceship. So if we, if I throw chemicals, bad chemicals into a river, the people that live downriver are, get bad water. If I w didn't know that, I would be stupid. You know, I should know that. So I don't want to do that. And I would always backpack and hike. So I like nature. I don't want to ruin the habitats for animals. So it, it just reinforced, for me, it reinforced what I already knew but in a real experiential way, you see this there, like you could see, for instance, I won't say which countries, but you could see the air pollution in some countries around some of their major cities was unbelievably thick. So when you're looking down, there was this grayish cloud, and it wasn't because of weather, it was because of factories, cars, things like that. And you couldn't even see the streets in the city, and you could see downwind, you know, this, this plume of dirty air is hitting a country down here that wasn't doing that. But it's like when I mentioned throwing things in the water and they go downstream. Well, here is the stream of air. And you go, you already knew it was true, but now you look and go, wow. This wasn't like you had to take a long time and look. You just glance and you go. So it, it reinforced that the things that we knew were theoretically true are there. So I, I, you know, it's not that I didn't think about it, but it's, it just shows you we're all on this and what we do, and we always knew it, I think most of us did, what we do affects other people. There's, there's a quote, what is it, no man is an island. You know, every man's death diminishes me. I think it's something like that. It's probably wrong, if it's on YouTube, somebody will tell me what the real quote is. But the point is, we're all interrelated. Things that you do can affect other people, and you should kind of think about that, because you can unintentionally hurt other people in many things, you know, whether it's environmentally or politically, uh, and everybody has different opinions about what's better for them. And you need to try to understand from the other person's perspective, everyone's not evil. They might want to do something different than I want to do, but they might have reasons. So maybe the first thing to do is understand why are they doing this? You know, and maybe we're disagreeing and we don't need to disagree so much. Uh, and that, that's everything from science things to environmental or political. So I think it reinforces those things things that we probably knew anyway, but it makes it, you know, in the forefront of your mind. Uh, speaking about the future, there will be a lot, many, many space flights, not only to near Earth orbit, but also to Moon, mm -hmm. Mars, and other planets or other moons. Yes. Uh, do you think there will be a huge demand for physician astronauts because space is dangerous and a lot of pro problems can harm their health? And would you like to have a group uh, of physicians to train uh, to become a physician astronauts of the future? Well. And when I was in the astronaut office in the United States, the, of people with a doctoral level education, you know, so PhD or MD, you know, the, the highest percentage of doctoral level education were physicians. I mean, there were people with PhDs in engineering, but what kind, like mechanical engineer, electrical, 
if you counted those as different categories, they were small numbers compared to physicians. Most of the physicians were also engineers, which I think was a very good thing because it's human spaceflight. So what we're doing, it's different than flying a telescope, like you know the James Webb Space Telescope. That's a huge engineering achievement, unbelievable huge engineering achievement. But once it's there and running, there's no people there. There's people on the ground. People designed it, people built it, and they were hugely important. But now once it's there, it's doing its thing. Um, when we're doing human spaceflight, as you say, going to the orbit, going to the moon, going to Mars, they're people. It's very much easier to send a rocket with nobody on it. You don't have to have a life support system. You don't have to have an atmosphere with oxygen. You don't have to have food. You don't have to take the carbon dioxide out of the air. You don't have their human waste to dispose of. You just have to usually give it electrons for the computers. That's all it needs. It doesn't need anything more than that. And to keep it not too cold, not too hot. So much of the way we design spacecraft that take humans, a lot of the expense, a lot of the space is for the humans. So to be involved in exploration with humans and not be a physician, then you don't understand what humans are doing. I mean, you can try to, but not at the same level a physician would. So the ideal thing is if physicians, in general, there are exceptions, but in general, if you have physicians that are only physicians, and there's some people who do aerospace medicine, that's their specialty, and they're much more experienced. And then you have the engineers. When they talk to each other, are they understanding each other? So ways they will use words, the, where, the way a, a, a physician, a medical doctor might use it, might not be the way the engineer heard it. And the engineer thinks he's building what the doctor wanted, but it's not. Whereas if you're both, then you're not confusing yourself. You know what you mean. And you also know, like in the tribe of engineers, that words, certain words have a different meaning. And you're careful to use the word in a way that they understand. And similarly, if the engineer says something, what does that mean? Like for instance, in medicine in the US, somebody say, can you appreciate this heart sound? What does appreciate mean? In English, most things appreciate mean like, do you like it, right? When a doctor says it means, can you hear it? So if I said to an engineer, can you appreciate the heart rate? And he goes like, do I like the fact that my heart beats? You know, but that's like a jargon. That's the physicians will say that. But if I was there, I'd say, no, what, do you, what they mean is, you know, can you hear the heart sound through all the static noise? I, that's a, an example. So I think there's a, certainly a place for it. There actually is, there is a specialty in medicine called aerospace medicine. It's part of preventive medicine. And it's getting much more attention now because of space flight. I mean, it was always used for flying airplanes and it was very pivotal and it got its biggest uh, emphasis during the wars, during World War I, especially World War II, where they were learning how to let people physiologically be able to fly airplanes. Now we understand that pretty well. You know, not that we can't understand more, but it's pretty good. Space flight, not so much. So, in fact, at the University of Michigan, where I'm a professor, we have a course, you know, for our, our, for our medical students about aerospace medicine, and there are courses at other places like the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston, Texas, and others for physicians to learn that. So it's, it, I think they will be needed. I think on space flights, I don't think you always need them because the amount of things you can do, if you think about it this way. So you're going to Mars. So you want to be able to diagnose if somebody has a problem, what it is. But it only matters if you can diagnose something you can fix or to predict what will happen down the line. Like suppose I have stomach pain. So my stomach hurts, big deal. If I know this is something that I can treat and make them better, that's a good thing. If, if I know it's something that needs to be treated, but it takes some wild surgery that I can't do, so I know it. I can't stop it. So I think the skill level you need in general to actually, is it, is it for diagnosis and planning, or is it for therapy to treat them? There's not much we can do about therapy and treating them. So we have to make sure whoever's there understands in the actual flying part enough to understand do they have a problem, and can we treat it based on the austere environment we're in? We're not in a major hospital in Yerevan. We're in a small little, it's like in the back of a, a recreational vehicle, a trailer, a caravan we're in. You know, we don't have a huge place to work, so you only have to know enough to say, is it something I do something about? Will this affect us being able to get done our mission? Should we decide I'm supposed to do a spacewalk? And they say, oh no, that'll be bad for you, but we should have you do it. That would be helpful. But if it's, I need 
I have a clot in my brain and I need to be operated. And I said, well, there's nothing we can do. Too bad for you. So it varies. Right now, we don't always fly a physician on the, on the station. We didn't fly him in the shuttle, but we trained our astronauts to know enough to be able to do that. So they were able to adequately treat whatever happened. Now, if we ever get to the point where we really can do, we're gonna live on the moon for years at a time, or Mars years at a time, and we don't wanna bring people back, then we'll have to say, do we wanna be able to do these much more complicated things? And then I think you'll need to have that. So I think it depends. They need to have knowledge, absolutely. Is there a place for physicians to help in the design and preparation? Absolutely. Do they have to be there on your fly? Not all the time, I think it would vary. And my last question, what would you advise to the Armenian children or adults, why not, who has this, this big dream of becoming an astronaut? Well, I think, just as I described before, when I was eight years old, I wanted to be an astronaut. And then I was foolish and thought, no one can be an astronaut. However, I still said it was important to do things I thought I enjoyed, that I had a passion for, and then try your hardest, do your best, and not give up. Those last things, try your hardest, do your best, are true whatever you want to be. If you want to be a physician, if you want to be a pharmacist, if you want to be an engineer, if you want to be a truck driver, doesn't matter. Those things are the same for everybody. And if you do the things you enjoy, then you'll probably do your best. If you're doing things you don't like, it's hard to do your best every day at something you don't like. So I think the thing is to say, what do you enjoy in life? And also to think, Everybody can't be an astronaut. There's, at this time, there's not enough positions to be an astronaut. So if here you're going to try to take courses in school that you think will make you a good candidate to become an astronaut, but you don't enjoy, I think that's stupid. I think that's poor planning because you're setting yourself up to be disappointed. So if you think thousands of people want to be an astronaut and they apply, say like last time, 8,000 people applied, they took, I think, 10 or 20. So. I'm sure that more than 20 people were qualified. So all those other people didn't get to be an astronaut. If they were doing everything in their life to that point that they did not like, they just did it because they thought it would make them an astronaut, think how sad you would be. Think how you'd feel like your life, that, that the 10 years in university and training for nothing. I think that's ridiculous, personally. Now some people do that, but I, I see many people that have done that and then aren't picked, and they feel like their life is a failure, that they've wasted years. Many more people I see, they did what they were interested in. And not, and I wanted to be an astronaut, but then I didn't have it as the front thing to be. It was still there, and then when the opportunity arose, I had done all these things that I wanted to do because I found them interesting, stimulating. And oh, and that made me a good astronaut. That's a, a good thing, so even if I weren't selected, Yes, I would be disappointed, but it wouldn't be like, why did I go to school to be an engineer? Why did I go to school to be a, a medical phys a doctor? Why did I go to pilot training? I didn't get to be an astronaut, I'm a failure. That wouldn't have been the case, I would have been disappointed. Whereas if I only did those things to be an astronaut, but didn't like being an engineer, didn't like math, didn't like physics, you know, I didn't like physiology, what a sad life I would have. So I think the key is, and I think most astronauts I hear talk to children, they go, Find what you enjoy, and then do your best. You know, if you're not sure, well, if you want to be an astronaut, then math and science is very important, so try it. If you really don't like it, then you probably should look for something else. There's many other careers that are fulfilling, that society needs that will fulfill you. Do those, they're, they're worthwhile too. I mean, suppose you want to be a, a, a musician. You don't, you know, actually physics is in, math, in music, but it, not the same kind. You know, you could be a great musician and have a, a wonderful life. You know, it would be a shame for somebody who wants to be a musician, make themselves do math and science, not be selected as an as a astronaut, and then always wish they had been a great musician, and now they're sad that they can't do it. I think that'd be the, a huge disappointment for them, for the people close to them. So I think, find what you like, work hard, do your best every day. That's the answer. Thank you, Mr. Bagian. I'm sure that a lot of children are already inspired from your lectures during the Starmus Festival, and maybe one of them accomplishes his or her big dream of becoming an, an astronaut, and maybe when he will be asked in future, how did you get inspired? Like I asked you during this interview, he can say, 
uh, Jim Bagian arrived in Armenia and gave this amazing lecture how cool the space is, and then I decided to become an astronaut. Well, if, if that were the case, that would, make, that would probably be the best thing to come out of anything I did at NASA. Not for the things I did there, but to motivate children to realize that nothing is impossible. I think that's the real key. And for people to understand that they can, they can be a world beater. That you know, you're the one that determines in large part, are you successful or not? Not other people, you. And it's all here in your head. And you need to tell yourself that. It doesn't mean every day is fun. I mean, there were times when I was an astronaut that I'm going to work. I didn't say, this is the most fun thing I ever did. No, but it takes hard work to do many things, just like musicians. Do you think every musician, every day they practice, that they were always enjoying every practice session? Probably not. There were some they enjoyed more than others, but they're glad they became a great musician. I think if, 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 if a child listening to this said that, boy, I really thought always do your best, do what you enjoy, do your best, never, never quit, I would say that would probably be the best legacy of anything I got from NASA. If people got that, I would be deliriously happy and joyful. <laughs>